Yeah, let me talk about global warming. There are still people who doubt global warming, even though here is the proof. There are actually 99% of all scientists working in this field do believe in global warming. So the question is not so much how we're going to have global warming. The question is, what can we do in order to minimize it? Now, in the Western world, about 40% of all energy is actually consumed in buildings. So that's why it becomes so important to think about buildings. That's why the European Union revealed the goal that all buildings have to become carbon neutral by 2050. Now, today, we don't even know how we do one single building carbon neutral. So that's what politicians do. They put goals so far into the future that it doesn't need any re immediate reaction. No radical immediate reaction. But let's think, of, think about how we could get there. Now, what we do at Transolar, we call climate engineering, and the idea is how can we bring to together the quality of the built environment and the energy performance. Now, in this spa, it's in Tokyo, we found this as an advertisement where they say, welcome to breathtaking Tokyo water park, where you can wash away the pressure and stress of the overcrowded city. <laughs> <clears throat> we really like this one because it talks a lot about the quality of the space. It doesn't matter how much energy they use, the energy consumption per person using this spa is actually negligible. At the same time, if we do a building which is just bad and people don't like it, it doesn't matter how efficient it is, it's a waste of resources. So the question is, and it makes it obvious, we have to bring environmental quality, architectural quality, but also performance we have to bring together. Now, I'm not a superhero who's going to save the world today. It's about the question of how can we approach it and how can we create ideas that can deal with this issue. Climate engineering, I mentioned before, what we do at Transolar, it's not brand new. Like, this is a spa built by the Roman Empire about 109 after, after Domini. And people asked about the orientation of this spa, and the only logical answer people have is that the architect provide an orientation or design this in an orientation so that they maximize the exposure for people to the sun and minimize the exposure to the wind. So the building provides shelter against the wind and is maximizing people towards the sun in order to maximize the environmental quality. So they had a very deep, very comprehensive understanding of climate engineering. Now, we at Transola, we got asked last year to do an installation at the Architecture Biennale in Venice, and we thought about what can we do, what can we show at an Architecture Biennale. So we came up with the idea that we should do a cloud, because we thought a cloud is the only thing where we can make climate engineering visible. So the idea was to do a floating cloud, and the question is, how can we do a floating cloud, having a comfortable layer at the bottom, and then the cloud is happens in a layer where we have 100% humidity, it's what we call saturated air, in which we can spray water and it stays. Now this has a lower density than dry air, so it floats above the bottom layer, but as soon as this saturated air layer is touching the ceiling, we get condensation and the cloud is gone. So we need to have a dry layer which is, has a lower density on top to protect prevent that the cloud layer is touching the ceiling. So this was the idea, and after months of test testing, this is how the space looked like. Tetsuo Kondo, a Japanese architect, he designed the space. He designed the ramp where people could walk through the cloud and experience the different layers. And this is an image from above the cloud. So now this, what has this to do with buildings? First of all, nothing, it's just the visualization of climate engineering. But the question is, how can we translate this knowledge into creating better buildings? This is what we see today. Many people talk about green building design, but what they do is they take something which is stupid to begin with and apply gadgets to it. Put a green roof on top, put a PV cell on it, collect some rainwater, 
put a bicycle rack on it, and then call it a day. This is not green building design. I think where we have to get to is actually designing buildings which become green, efficient by design, and not by gadgets. And this can actually provide a new type of aesthetics, like with this sailboat, and provide actually more beautiful environments. Also, let me talk a little bit about the history of building of architecture over the last century. This is the Flatiron Building, from, which is located in New York City, designed in 1902. And what you see is that every single window has external shading. Every single window is operable for natural ventilation. People are all located along the facade so that, so that they have access to light and air. And the simple reason was that Carrier invented air conditioning in the, tw in the 20s. So none of these buildings you see in this image had air conditioning. As soon as we had air conditioning, designers became ignorant, and suddenly architecture looked like this. And if you look at the glass building in the middle, this is also Manhattan, but it also could be Shanghai, it could be Dubai, it could be the North Pole, it could be everywhere. Architecture became independent of the place. And now, if you look at this building, there's no windows operable, there's no shading, there's so much coating on glass that the light they get inside the building is not even white anymore, and most people are not even located at the facade. So within 80 years development of architecture, we got a worse performance and worse environmental qualities. And you know what? If they have a power outage in New York City, people even have to leave this building. They can't even survive. That's what happened in 80 years of architectural development. So now, do we have to go back doing flat iron buildings? No, the question is, getting this understanding of climate engineering and bringing it back into contemporary design, into contemporary architecture. And this is what happened a lot in Europe and now in North America, that people think about breezing walls, breezing facades. <clears throat> and this is a building designed by Benish Architect, and which is actually here in Hamburg where they used the first time an ET, a single ETFE layer at the outside to create a filter against the wind and the climate conditions, uh, the harsh wind at the harbor in Hamburg, so that their people could still have natural ventilation, that people could still have access on the shading and a well performance, and it was the first time when people started to think also about the embodied energy. What does it mean to, how much energy does it take to build buildings, and an ETFE foil requires much less energy to be built than glass. So this is the next level in the evolution, and also provides new opportunities for new type of statics. And what we recognize, the design is the key for the evolution, to the good or to the bad. Now, we have to take it and put it or direct it to the good. I think that's our task. I want to show you two buildings we have worked on as an example. The first one is a building for Manitoba Hydro, a utility company in the prairie in Canada, which, was, which had the goal at the very first beginning to become the most energy efficient high-rise structure in North America. When we looked at the climate conditions in Winnipeg, and I have to say we worked on this with KPMB architects from Toronto, we are not architects, we are engineers. We support the design process, we bring the knowledge to the design process in order to guide and to provide, make sure that we get informed decision throughout the design process. But when we studied the climate conditions in Winnipeg, we actually recognized that first of all, it's super cold there. They have temperatures of minus 35 degrees, and almost half the year, they have temperatures below freezing. And in summer, it actually gets hot, they get plus 35, and it becomes humid. And when I went there for the interview, and it was in January, I got out, out of the airport, and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die right away, and I jumped in a cab, and I said to the taxi driver, oh, this is cold here. And he said to me, you think this is cold? We just got a heat wave. <laughs> <laughs> then you actually know what the climate is about. So, but when we talked to the people, they always told us, whenever it's really cold, it's always sunny. So we looked into it, and we found more solar radiation we get in wintertime, especially on a vertical south facade, than in every other cold city in the world. 
There is no place where you get so much solar radiation in winter time than they have here in Winnipeg. They have actually more solar radiation than the city of Milan has. And this in this cold environment. So we said, if there is a place on this planet to do passive solar design, it's actually Winnipeg. Some people in the 70s tried it in Arizona and New Mexico. I think it was not a good idea. So we ended up with a design where we have buffer zones facing to the south, and these buffer zones are six-story atrias, and they are actually the lung of the building where air enters the building, and from there we distribute it through a raised floor system into the office environment, and then we exhaust it into a chimney where it goes down into the basement. In the basement, we do have heat recovery that transfers the heat from the exhaust and brings it back into the South Winter Gardens to the supply unit. Now, in, for additional heating and cooling, we have radiant systems so that from the ceiling, we support the heating and cooling of the building. And then in summer, when we do not need any heat recovery, the air goes into the chimney and we exhaust naturally. We call this a solar chimney. Now, a chimney effect, like warm air, goes up. We all know this. This is what we call the chimney effect. Now, in summer, it happens that it's outside as warm as inside, so there is no chimney effect. So we glaze it on top of the building so that the sun overheats the exhaust and keep this natural flow running. I think that's the entire principle. So very straightforward. In addition, we do have a geothermal system to provide heating and cooling to the building that makes it super efficient. Now, this is the South Winter Garden, this six-story South Winter Garden. This is actually the air handling unit of the system, this is the, of the building. This is the mechanical room of the building, and it's probably the most beautiful mechanical room we ever built. And people even use it for having their yoga classes. This is the North Atrium, what we call the North Atrium, where we collect all the exhaust air from the building before it goes into the solar chimney. And you see people find their spots to have their informal meetings, which is very important so that the operational aspects of the building suddenly becomes connected to the social aspects. Suddenly these buffer zones become zones where people can meet and have these intermediate meetings. Now, in terms of energy, if we look at the numbers, average Canadian buildings use something like 570 kilowatt hours. Based on code, they go down to 480. Now they have to be down to something like 260. And they're very efficient, getting support, going down to something like 190. The Manitoba Hydro building is designed for 88 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. So this is what we mean when we talk about green and sexy. I think we have to provide better environments, but also making it more efficient. And where we become very proud if, in this case, the solar chimney is something that is supporting the operation, the efficiency of the building, suddenly also becomes part of the identity of the building. Now, another building, completely different climate, completely different environment was the French school in Damascus where we worked with the French architecture firm Atelier Lyon from Paris. And the idea there was at the very first beginning it has to be low budget and it has to be a building which can be operated without air conditioning. Because all the parents, first of all, they had to pay for the construction, but also the parents wanted to have an environment without air conditioning. So we studied, can we do a building, a school building in Damascus without air conditioning. And what we found, despite the re really high temperatures during the day, it's actually getting pretty cold in Damascus during the nighttime. So the simple idea was that between these classroom buildings, we create a nice microclimate, we have a fabric shading, we grow some vegetation below so that we have a nice microclimate. From this microclimate, we draw the air through pipes which are embedded in the ground slab to cool it down before we supply it into the classrooms. And the entire machine that operates it is, again, this solar chimney. And it operates it only also at nighttime, so that we, at nighttime we really refresh the building, cool down the entire building, the entire mass of the building that keeps it cool for the next day. So when we worked on this, the mechanical engineer from the Lebanon, he said to us, you know what, 
I don't care what you guys are doing. As soon as you are gone, I'm going to put air conditioning into this building. <laughs> now, this building is now operating for two years and still has no air conditioning. Now, these are just two examples. I could show you many more of buildings we have worked on, but the point is, these are only examples. Like, we are still talking about lighthouse projects. Bruce Mao once said, we have to design the norm. I think this is where we have to get to. So how can we distribute the ideas? And I think we have to distribute it. We have to collaborate. Everything, everybody working in this field, despite of profit thinking and ego. So parallel to the Biennale, to the architecture Biennale, which was running over a period of three months, we had something we called the Cloudscapes Award. So beyond the physical cloud, we wanted to have a virtual cloud of ideas. So we designed this award together with our friend Daniel Dendra from, Ber from Berlin, and people could submit their ideas on the internet, and everybody could see the ideas, and the online community could vote for the best ideas. So the online community voted for the six runners-up every month, and so after three months, we had 18 runners up from which an international jury selected uh, the best ideas. So everybody could see the ideas, and they're still online, and we highly encourage you to look at these ideas. There are great ideas under all the submission. We got almost 50 submissions. Over the period of three months, we had almost 250,000 clicks on this website and more than 130 countries participated in the competition. So we thought it, this was a real success. We have to repeat it around a different topic. But the next thing is also we have to think about what are the implications for our cities. And I think the implications for our cities are even bigger than thinking about just one building. So we started the next uh, collaboration which we call Future City Lab. It's a collaboration among some experts and something like more than 10 universities worldwide to design a positive utopia of 2050. Now everybody is talking about uh, the catastrophe of global warming. I think we have to look at the opportunities and to show and demonstrate and design for the future so that it not just happens. Thank you very much.